Uh, hello everybody, uh, my name is Stephen Webster. I'm the founder of charity FND Dimensions. Uh, we're here as part of one of the videos that's being put together uh, for the UK FND Awareness Day on March the 25th this year. Um, the UK FND Awareness Day is a collaboration between three UK charities, ourselves, FND Dimension, FND Action and FND Friends. And for the first time this year, uh, we're also uh, being joined by our colleagues in Australia, FND Support Services. So four charities coming together under one umbrella for one event under the hashtag Voices for FND. And as part of that, we're get, have doing a range of videos with doctors and other patients um, to sort of get a broad view and opinions about FND, how people are coping with it, how people are living with it, and what's going on in the, in the wider FND world. And indeed, that's very much what I'm going to be speaking to Professor John Stone this morning about. Good morning, John. Morning, Steve. Yeah. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself to uh, the audience? Sure. So I'm, a, I'm a, a neurologist here in Edinburgh. I've been um, doing research on FND for over 20 years. Um, and um, I'm also currently now the secretary of the new International FND Society, uh, which I hope to tell you a bit more about. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly one of the things we want to cover. We're, we're going to be looking at a couple of things in this interview. Um, some about the general developments in the FMD world, which John is very much a part of and leading. Um, and then a little bit about some of the research that's coming out and language that's used. Uh, also, um, uh, we want to talk about potential uh, that people, think, uh, tools people can use to help themselves uh, once they've been given an FMD diagnosis. So uh, we'll kick off straight away then, John, with question number one, which is, um, can you tell us a bit about the UK FN Forum and what it is and what it intends to do, please? Yeah, so this is, um, this is a new initiative. Um, we, we, for some years, we've had a very informal sort of mailing list of health professionals called FN Forum, which was an international thing. And that's morphed in, that's morphing into the FND society. But the, there was a real need for um, health professionals in the UK who are involved in developing um, FND services in particular to try and come together, work together, um, share information um, and that's what the UK FN forum is. So it's a grouping of uh, neurology, psychiatry, occupational therapy, speech and language therapy, physiotherapy etc. FND is a problem that crosses lots of disciplines, it doesn't really belong to one discipline alone um, yeah. and there are a number of examples of really uh, of, of services that have appeared in the last few years across the UK um, and this is a, really an attempt to try and bring the bring people together if someone's wanting to start a service um, to as a, as, a, as a sort of resource for that kind of dating agency for health but it's really for health professionals but hopefully it's an example um, for patients to see that there are health professionals who want to do much better for FND and for patients right. with FND in the UK. Excellent. Okay, and I suppose there's now on the large, larger scale, you mentioned in your introduction, um, the FNDS, the Functional Neurological Disorder Society. Um, how do you see this developing and what, is, and what are the key aims of that? Well, again, it's a new, it's a new uh, organization. Um, we had a meeting in 2017 in Edinburgh, uh, which Alan Carson, Mark Hallett, and myself organised, and um, we were a bit nervous organising it because there wasn't any sort of tradition of a, of a regular scientific meeting for health professionals. But we organised that, and we're really amazed and delighted that about 550 people came from all yeah. over the world. Fantastic! I think that really just shows how common FND is and how many health professionals are want to do better. Now, so on the back of that, we've been able to start this new society. You can Google it, fndsociety.org. It is for health professionals. I think we need to get our own house in order, um, work together, um, learn from each other, from each other's perspectives. Um, and so we're holding another three-day meeting in Boston in June, uh, coronavirus permitting. Um, 
and uh, it's it's promises a really exciting meeting. We're going to have training workshops. We're going to have uh, sort of state of the art science talks, um, and lots of clinical uh, sort of presentations. So it is for health professionals. Uh, patients um, patients can register and come if they want to, but it is is very much for health professionals. But we are very keen to work with. Uh, patient organizations as well yeah I mean one of the one of the great things that's come out of that for as as the charities is the the invitation to be community partner organizations obviously we're not medical professionals and as you say and that that's what the organization is there for but the fact that you're the the organization is willing to bring us on board is is, is really good um, yeah. because in many ways we're, we're at the sharp end as well Absolutely. Well, it's, it's really clear to me that I don't think health people doing research in this area or developing services they have to do it in have to do it with patients. People who've got this condition know what it's like to live with. Um, I've certainly it, uh, all, all the interactions I've had with patient organisations over the years has really um, changed my outlook and also you know I think just in sm small things like the wording that we use and things like that it makes a makes a big difference. I think. Yeah, quite. And that kind of leads on to the, the sort of third question, really, in terms of um, um, there's still some, some research seems to be that coming out and, and the language that is used is not always most <coughs> conducive to sort of um, potentially uh, bringing people on board uh, and often seems to still re to refer to FND as a psychiatric condition. Um, yeah. Uh, often the research also often mentions FND uh, being the interface between neurology and psychiatry, and this term now neuropsychiatry is commonly used. But what does that actually mean? Yeah. So I understand why that why this causes difficulties. I think when people hear the word neuropsychiatry, for example, they sometimes just hear the word psychiatry. So yeah neuropsychiatry is meant is isn't it is trying to be a word that encapsulates this idea of of things that are at the interface between neurology and psychiatry it's not meant to be a word that means it's all psychiatric right. um but i you know i do understand why why people misinterpret it that way and in fact you know neuropsychiatry actually encompasses a very wide range of um, condition. So, for example, um, if you think about Parkinson's disease, I would say Parkinson's disease is a neuropsychiatric disorder because many of the symptoms of Parkinson's are uh, psychological. So, for example, the, one of the earliest symptoms of Parkinson's is anxiety that begins about 10 years often before people start to get a shake. And then one of the later symptoms of Parkinson's is um, dementia, cognitive problems, emotional yeah. symptoms. So, most neurological conditions involve span symptoms that might be considered psychological like anxiety or physical symptoms such as tremor and i don't think and I, I don't personally see fnd any differently to that um so it is really hard because the language that we have uh in society and even me sitting here as a as a neurologist is very dualistic so people think well you're either a brain doctor you're a mind doctor but actually most conditions that affect the brain just don't work like that and um, it's much more interesting and complex than that so we have to find ways to talk about disorders that don't um, that aren't so dualistic and uh, I think I also would caution against people being stigmatizing anything psychiatric i know why people do it they, they work because they've had bad experiences they feel that they're not being taken seriously but we mustn't in doing that stigmatize psychological disorders either right right and do you think that's something that's kind of now being built more into the training of neurologists or psychiatrists you know in, in terms of understanding that i think it is and i see i'm really encouraged by the way that younger neurologists uh, well, about, not just it, but I think I, th I think the specialty generally is embracing this model. I think right. when I started out in neurology, it was a very old school view, which was that neurologists just look for brain diseases that you can see on scans, and that's their job. 
yeah. and anything else is really not their job. I think um, we're seeing, for example, FMD being incorporated into, hopefully into the training curriculum of UK neurologists in a way that it really wasn't before. Right. Um, so yeah, fingers crossed. Excellent, that's good. Um, with FND said to me the one of the, well I think it was the second most common reason for neuro, a neurology neurology excuse me referral. How can things like the awareness day under the hashtag Voices for FND help to influence future research, the training from, from med, medical professionals that we've been talking about, and support for patients? How how do you kind of see it from your perspective? Hmm. Well, I think the what I've seen in the last um, few years particularly and it's escalating over the last few years is the way that when patients are getting involved in this and becoming visible and talking about having FND what a difference that can make to the cases that we're making as health professionals for services and the cases that we're making for research so um, and that, of course, happens on lots of sort of platforms and Twitter and Facebook and yeah. events and news articles. These things are all starting to make a difference. People are starting to see this is actually a condition, whereas previously it was invisible. Right. Um, so I think these awareness days matter a lot uh, in terms of as a fo sort of focal point for that kind of activity. And, and if someone's, you know, is new to the area or they've just developed they've just developed the condition to see that lots of other people have it too they're not alone this is not some sort of weird uh, condition it really is common and lots of people experience these problems right excellent okay and the last question we've got for you this morning john is um we've spoken a lot about the changes that are going on and the developments within the f and d world which are great and hopefully you know will help to move things forward in a very positive way but the reality for a lot of patients and people we're living with FND, once they get that diagnosis, is that they're still waiting for treatment. You know, the waiting lists are long, as you said, you know, there is a need to develop services. Um, are there any suggestions that you would have that patients could use as sort of a sort of a like a little self-help guide, things that they can do to help their symptoms, help themselves, and sort of get their heads around the condition? Yeah. Well, of course, that does depend, of course, what stage you're at and what kind of yeah. uh, experience you've had so far. But um, with a bit of luck, you're a patient who has received a diagnosis and you understand why that diagnosis is being made. That 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 step is often missing. In fact, right. uh, people think it's a sort of dustbin diagnosis that's made just because the scans are normal. It's not It's based on positive features. Um, so getting your head around the reason for the diagnosis if possible and if you haven't managed to do that from neurologist um, one tip there is if you want to try and get information from your, your, your neurologist rather than ringing uh, write a letter to your neurologist and because that will often might stimulate them to write to have to write back to you and explain right. <laughs> yes um, that's one idea um, if if, you've, if you're reasonably confident that the diagnosis is correct, which is an important platform, then there are obviously, there are places to go and find out more. And I do think the more that people really understand this condition or what we know about it, the more that does help. So obviously there's information on your site and other patient-led charities. There's my website, neurosymptoms.org. Um, choose the just look at the symptoms that you have and don't worry about symptoms that you don't have. Everyone's different. Um, you know, no, nobody gets all of the symptoms of FND. Um, there, are, there are very common issues that many patients have, for example, with fatigue management. Um, so learning some principles of um, trying to avoid boom and bust cycles of overactivity and underactivity. Yeah, there's quite a lot of information about that. So, uh, so initially, some sort of pacing activities can be quite helpful. There's information about graded exercise uh, available as well on my website, which is something to think about once you've sort of evened out your boom and bust yeah. uh, a bit. If you're working with your GP, um, then you might want to share or, or show your GP the physiotherapy consensus recommendations. 
uh, for FND, for functional motor disorders. And you might want to have a look at those yourself. They're available on, the, on my website on the physiotherapy page. Okay. Um, the very the very detailed recommendations, and they might help a physiotherapist that you're seeing already, uh, or help your GP um, point you in the right direction. We're working. Hopefully, very soon there's going to be some occupational therapy consensus recommendations coming um, in the next month or so, and actually a, a referral to a, to an occupational therapist for advice about graded uh, about fatigue or pain management. Yeah. can be quite helpful um, and then if you have seizures for example there's uh, I would recommend the fact sheet that's available on the codes trial website it's codestrial.org it's also available as a link through on my website that that's that seems to be um, that we, we've actually tested patients responses to that as part of the a clinical trial and patients said they found that helpful as an introduction to why they were having seizures. Right, right. Okay, well, thank you. There's, uh, there's obviously much to learn. And so I think one of the, as one of John said there, one of the, the key ones to go to is John's own website, neurosymptoms.org, because that, that links to many of the other things that um, are available to patients. And it, it's a good starting point. And it's also I think, a good starting point for um, family members and things to try and get their head around it people are your carers um uh, because obviously it, it's it's a big thing for them to learn about as well um but uh, well, 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 so one of the tip i've mentioned mentioned on the on the there's some really excellent videos made by alex len and fnd australia um which are available on the on the video page on my site as well there's sort of four very brief um videos introducing what FND is and that I think is is a, is a nice place to start for someone who's, who has no idea what this condition is at all. Excellent, thank you. Well thank you for your time this morning John, uh, I think we've been going about a quarter of an hour now which is probably a yep. good enough length for probably these videos. For <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> um, obviously there's going to be much going on during the, the uh, week around the 25th of March uh, this year so it's the UK FND Awareness Week uh, and the end awareness down the 25th under the hashtag voices for FND. But um, thank you to you, John, as you always, you're, you're always very willing and, you know, to take part in these things. And we're very grateful for that. No, my pleasure, Steve. It's great. But, okay. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Thanks very much. much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye then.